Tonight, Israel at war and Congress in chaos. Obama, you can see so many streaks of smoke. The death toll mounts in Israel and Gaza as Israeli forces track down Hamas terrorists within their borders. What's next in the volatile war? Plus... We need to make sure we're sending a message to people all throughout the world that the House is open and doing the people's business. A speakerless House for yet another day, leaving crucial aid for Israel and Ukraine in limbo. The late-breaking developments on Capitol Hill as Republicans inch closer to choosing their next speaker, but fail to get the job done. And... As the Israeli response to this week's attack continues in Gaza, we speak with one aid worker on the desperate need for supplies for the civilians caught in the crosshairs. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with the horrors of war, the haunting images, the mounting death tolls in Israel and Gaza. We're learning new details about the extent of Hamas's planning prior to the attack. Hamas official Ali Baraka claims the group has been planning these atrocities for two years. Israel has continued to pound Gaza from the air, more than 450 targets in 24 hours, even as Hamas terrorists are still believed to be holding 150 hostages in Gaza. The death toll on both sides is staggering. An estimated 2,100 people killed in Israel, among them 22 Americans, and 1,100 dead in Gaza, women, children, and babies dying on both sides. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu put aside a bitter political rivalry to create a unity government with former opponents opponents, Hamas launching rockets into Israel. Our team there as a southern town took fire for a second day, some rockets breaking through Israel's defenses. And there are skirmishes along Israel's northern border as well, Israeli forces trading fire with Hezbollah militants inside Lebanon. And the first shipment of U.S. munitions has arrived in Israel. A U.S. Navy battle group is already in the region. And speaking late today, President Biden said the U.S. government is doing everything it can to get U.S. hostages home. Our team is on the ground tracking every aspect of this difficult story. We begin with our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, with the excruciating scenes playing out in those southern villages and how this conflict has unified what was once a very divided country. Israel at war after the deadliest attack on the Jewish people since the Holocaust. The conflict now shifting from the ground to the air. As we journey from town to town across Israel's war-ravaged south, the horrific death toll is mounting. The elderly, women, children, soldiers, no one spared from Hamas's brutality. And as hundreds of thousands of Israelis get called up to fight, for these southern Israeli towns and villages, the sheer terror of war is everywhere. Our team was caught in the middle in Ashkelon, just a few miles north of Gaza. Above us, you can see so many streaks of smoke crisscrossing the sky. Massive bomb. This is a massive bombardment. We're hearing glass break. I think that's from. These are pieces from the rockets that are actually falling from the sky right now. Those are the shreds from the intercepts or the rockets that blew them up, and you can hear them tinkling down as they begin to drop all over. I've never heard that before. Do you hear all that tinkling? Yeah. That's pieces of metal falling from the sky from the exploding interceptors and I guess the rockets that they've hit. We scrambled to put on our flak jackets. Just a few hundred yards away, we find the aftermath of a Hamas rocket. This is what people go through here every single day. This is why this town is a ghost town. Everything in Israel is a ghost town. 
because of that. It has been incessant. We run to a bomb shelter nearby where we find terrified families huddled in the darkness. She's saying we're okay to tolerate this. There, as long as there is no Hamas, there's no Hezbollah. Um, she said that there are disabled people upstairs that can't get down. It is very hot and stifling in here, she says. And this is the only light they have. She said from Saturday, they're here pretty much the entire time. Finally, we meet the former head of security for the town. Good to see you. Hi. They lost every shade of human humanity. They, they, even animals don't do that. In the eyes of the Israelis, it shattered every option, every possibility that we had for a normal life near this identity. Now we understand as a country that if we want to exist, there is no place for Hamas. We are not saying Gaza. We don't aim, Israelis never aim to annihilation of people. But definitely, we have to erase Hamas. These are parts that actually fell into your garden? Yeah. You guys sleep in, in the bomb shelter right now? Yes, that's true. Yeah, well, I'm trying to, you know, a lot of kids in my age are very scared, but I'm trying to keep it cool down. Wow. I don't think it's right that a 15 years old and even Kids, even younger than me, see it as a regular living. They, they go outside and search for parts of the bombs. It's not normal. Ch kids don't have to live like this. The unspeakable horror is becoming clearer as soldiers and the world learn what happened here Saturday. This is the town of Kfar Aza. Um, there are military chiefs, tanks everywhere. We understand that there were dozens and dozens of people killed here. There may still be bodies out in this town right now. The military only now able to see the full extent of the horror that unfolded in this leafy kibbutz, home to so many young families. You see the babies, the mother, the fathers in their bedrooms, in their protection rooms, and how the terrorists kill them. It's not a war. It's not a battlefield. It's a massacre. We are with the soldiers as they go door to door, bringing out the murder is the uh, incredibly grim task that these soldiers have of uh, wrapping up a body right in that room zipping up the body bag and then we hear soldiers praying israel forming an emergency wartime government and prime minister netanyahu urging unity in a national address but a matter of weeks ago this country was more divided than ever Netanyahu's judicial overhaul plan plunged Israel into nine months of demonstrations, the largest and longest protest movement in the country's 75-year history, exposing bitter divisions in society along the way. The move to weaken the Supreme Court's power was seen as a power grab by Netanyahu's far-right government as it removed the ability for judges to strike down unreasonable decisions. Israelis fear everything from the protection of civil rights, minority rights, the freedom of the press and secular education is at risk. And that the changes to the judiciary are meant to benefit Netanyahu, who's facing a corruption trial. His far-right party not pushing a two-state solution or any compromise in the West Bank. Israel bulldozing Palestinian villages there this year, and the area has seen the highest number of Palestinians killed by Israel in nearly two decades. Gaza, on the other hand, not drawing as much of the government's focus. And there are questions about warning signs that may have been missed along the way. So what comes next for this nation, born after the unspeakable atrocities of the Nazis, founded as a place of hope for the Jewish people? The national anthem, Hatikva, meaning the hope, sung far and wide these past few days, including in this bomb shelter in Tel Aviv. In part, it translates as, as long as within our hearts the Jewish soul sings, our hope is not yet lost. And back in that other bomb shelter, a sense of resolve through the overwhelming grief as a united Israel barrels towards an uncertain future.
ושראש העיר שלנו יפנה אותנו מפה כמה שיותר מהר. גם לאלעד, שהיא רוצה להיות מהר עד ישראל סאונד. איך היה היום? קשה מאוד. It is no way to live. Our, our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, joins us now. Matt, thank you so much for your in-depth report. Uh, you've spent so much time reporting in Israel over the years. Do you feel like this is as unified as you've ever seen this country in some time? Definitely, Lindsay. Um, there is near unanimity in Israel that Hamas needs to be destroyed, and not just militarily, but the entire political organization as well. And I've never seen Israelis come together in this way in the 20-some years that I've been covering this. But it is temporary. Once this war or conflict is over, there is going to be a reckoning. People are go going to want to know why so many warning signs were missed, how the intelligence was in the dark about what Hamas had been planning for many months and how the military failed to respond quickly enough and how the political echelon, including Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, led them down this path. That reckoning will eventually happen, Lindsay. Yeah, it will ultimately. And interesting to see that unity right behind you flashing between the American flag and Israeli flag. Matt Gutman, once again for us, reporting from Tel Aviv. Thanks so much, Matt. And tonight, we also travel to what's being called Israel's Ground Zero, a small farming community near the Gaza border named Barry. It's one of the earliest and bloodiest scenes of Hamas's terror attack. Our own David Muir saw the horror firsthand at the kibbutz, where Hamas attackers went door to door, killing 107 people, mothers, fathers, children, and taking others as hostage. And we do want to warn you, this may be difficult to watch. Today, we went to find a place many here are calling Israel's Ground Zero one of the bloodiest scenes from the Hamas terror attack. As we get closer, we see the massive troop presence. It was here a brutal and chilling scene played out Saturday morning. Tonight, the haunting surveillance images posted online showing the beginning of the horror just after sunrise in Beri, Israel, a kibbutz not far from the Gaza border. Two heavily armed Hamas militants right outside the gate, crouching down, one on his stomach, peering under the gate then walking to the security window, smashing it and crawling in. Moments later, a car pulls up to the gate, the terrorists waiting to ambush them. As the gate opens, one attacker walks toward them and fires, killing them. Then running in, one of the attackers grabbing the security camera. Minutes later, the attackers can be seen from another camera, walking through the center of Berry, hunting for civilians. This video showing the militants taking Israeli hostages on the street. Their hands behind their backs, marching them away. And then the images showing people lying motionless on the ground, right there off in the distance. Authorities say they were killed. Today, for the first time, the Israeli military allowed us to see it. You can see that we're approaching the gate now to the kibbutz. This is what you actually saw in that surveillance of the Hamas militants waiting just outside the gate, uh, simply waiting for it to open so they could sweep in and begin their killing. Immediately, we see the shattered security window where they waited to attack. The charred car sitting at the entrance. We see where that surveillance camera once was, wires now hanging. And it was not long before we witnessed something else, the scope of the brutality here. There are no words to describe it. What's been left behind here is simply horrifying. The Israeli military uh, telling us that the Hamas militants uh, came in from four or five different directions uh, and began indiscriminately killing mothers, fathers, their children. They tell us in this home right here, they held 14 people hostage uh, during the hours of terror as it was unfolding. The homes here cratered from rockets and from the grenades the attackers brought in with them, littered with bullet holes. On the ground, we find a child's dictionary, a shoe, and everywhere here, the smell of death. What did these militants do when they got to this kibbutz? They massacred everybody here. Uh, 112 residents of this kibbutz were, were murdered. We can see just the level of destruction of what happened. And uh, when we imagine you know, they come in early morning, uh, people are asleep at 6, 6.30 in the morning, surprise them in their homes, some butchered in their beds. It, it's horrific. 
They killed more than 100 people here, and they took captives, too. You're all convinced that members of this community, some of them were taken captive and dragged into Gaza? Correct. Correct. And we can't imagine what is going on with them right now. Here in this community, Orthodox religious volunteers have been recovering the bodies here. But we also notice what's been left behind. Everywhere you look here, you see the signs of brutality, what was done to the families here in those early morning hours. And then you come upon this, uh, wrapped in plastic here, another body. Uh, this one, though, is different. You can see in red here, they have written simply, terrorist. They were ruthless. Even the children, they did not spare. And everywhere here, the signs of a morning cut short. It is heartbreaking to see uh, what's been left behind here. These are uh, family photos and a wedding photo here, uh, a photo of, of a father with his child. Uh, but perhaps what hits the most are these backpacks, uh, the children's school bags left right here in the open. The scope of the brutality here, uh, there are almost no words for this. It's no words for this, you know something between ISIS and a pogrom. It's not a battlefield, it's not a war, it's a murder. It's a terror attack. I cannot, uh, you cannot imagine what we saw here in the last three or four days. And you know, you was between the houses, think on the body, on the mothers, the babies, you know, people that kill by knife, by hand grenade, by fire in the hands children in the front of the mother, mother in the front of the children, people that locked by their hand, by their foot, and shoot it. And as night falls here, the light's still on. What's particularly haunting is what's been left behind here. Uh, as you know, the terrorists got here first thing in the morning as the sun was coming up. Many of these families were just waking up to start their day, and you can see in so many of these homes, the lights have been left on, the families are gone. Uh, you can see right here the bags, the hats, a woman's purse, and we couldn't help but to notice back here uh, is the kitchen. And we knew that these normal daily routines were just beginning. There's actually milk on the counter and beyond us, a table that has been set. More than four days now after that brutal attack, the sounds here at night are still chilling. It is though it's frozen in time here now. You can hear the rockets off in the distance, the cars, the doors open, family belongings there strewn on the sidewalk. Another car here, the door left open too. There are signs everywhere of families uh, trying to flee, trying to escape. And in another telling sign, you can hear the alarms, now days after this attack, still going off. Those alarms still ringing tonight, a cry for help for those families who had no idea, no warning, this was coming. It's heartbreaking. I have never seen anything like this. Uh, as we walk through the streets, we can see homes, we're seeing family photos, we're seeing remnants of regular life uh, and just unbelievable destruction and, and massacre. And it's, it's devastating to be here. And the smell and the sights and the destruction, and I, it's, it's a nightmare. Such haunting images. Our thanks to David Muir for that. For more perspective on what's happening on the front lines, we'd like to bring in Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Conriquez, spokesperson for the Israel Defense Forces. Thank you so much for joining us, especially during this time. Uh, from where you're sitting, what's the likelihood of a ground invasion of Gaza? About five days into the fighting, we have uh, suffered 1,200 Israelis dead, most of them civilians. I'm sure that you can understand that it wouldn't be wise of me to communicate what the next stage of our operations are. I can, however, say that we have, as you know, a significant, a sizable uh, amount of, inf of uh, reserve soldiers that have been called up and are now in southern Israel around the Gaza Strip. They are getting ready for various missions. These are infantry, armor, uh, artillery, combat engineers, and other ground forces, which are currently there, deployed and getting ready. 
Uh, understood. Okay, I have heard you say that the actions of Hamas leave no room for mercy toward Hamas. But what about the Palestinians and the innocent civilians who are losing their lives at this point? They are not the aim. They are definitely not the aim. And we, the IDF, continue to be committed to the law of armed conflict. It is a guiding principle in our, all of our wars, and it will be so in this one as well. Uh, we are not focusing on them. We are focusing on dismantling the military capabilities of Hamas. Well, you say that they're not the aim, but I do want to look at some numbers that we got, and these are a day old. Uh, but we saw fully destroyed 168 buildings, including 1,009 residential units, schools, 48 schools destroyed, government buildings, 23 destroyed, ambulances, 12 have been directly targeted, Mental, uh, medical institutions, 10 bombed, including seven hospitals. If the Palestinians are, are not, if Hamas is the target, then, then why go for, for hospitals and schools and, and ambulances? Just a question. Do you have the same tally for the vehicles, houses, etc., on the Israeli side? I oh, will yeah. set that aside. We do. Yes, yeah. we do. Because I think it provides uh, context. And I think that, you know, your viewers have seen yesterday and today the consequences of what Hamas did in our communities to our civilians. And this wasn't the civilians being in the wrong place. This was the civilians were the target. We are not Hamas. We're not targeting the, the civilians. But the sad reality in Gaza is that the Hamas, cowards as they are, are hiding all of their military infrastructure beneath the civilians, or they are embedding themselves within civilian buildings. So they always use civilian locations, and they hope that the fact that they use their own civilians and the civilian infrastructure as their human shields will shield them from our activity. That is wrong. That is a war crime to use civilians as human shields. Uh, of course, another thing Hamas is guilty of, taking some estimated 150 hostages, it's feared that they are now in Gaza. How does that further complicate the bombardment of Gaza, knowing or believing at least that there are hostages in that area? Yes, this is unprecedented. Uh, we faced, we have faced hostage situations in the past. We've been dealing with Palestinian terrorism for many years, and we've had hostages, never this many, never in such a complex situation, and never so many civilians. Uh, we've had military and uh, we've had civilians, but really in small numbers. Here we are talking about young men and women, but we're also talking about uh, the elderly, disabled people, children, infants, and even I know of a Holocaust survivor that is held hostage by Hamas. It definitely creates a very, very challenging environment to operate in. But uh, if Hamas thinks that by taking hostages, they will be able to escape what awaits them and the dismantling of their military capabilities, I think that our actions will prove that assumption wrong. And Hamas will see that their barbaric uh, behavior, which has been displayed for all the world to see what Hamas really is and what their planned actions were, will be their undoing. Any reason to believe those hostages are still alive? Intelligence is very, very sketchy at this time. And uh, of course, it's a high, highest priority mission. Lieutenant Colonel Kenricus, I uh, cannot thank you enough for your time, certainly tough times, and, and uh, for, for you fielding those sometimes tough questions. We really appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. An extraordinary tale of survival by a 16-year-old Israeli-American gunman burst into his family's home and killed his parents. He hid for hours with a gunshot wound to the stomach. ABC's James Longman spoke with the team. These are the memories 16-year-old Rote Matthias will cherish, his parents Deborah and Shlomi singing and laughing with family and friends. But that life was destroyed in an instant when Hamas terrorists burst into the family's kibbutz. His parents killed, trying to protect Rotem from the gunfire. They threw a grenade or something. It exploded. The last thing my dad said is he lost his arm. And 
Then my mom died on top of me. His sister survived the carnage, hiding out in another shelter. When the gunman returned, Rotem took cover under a bloody cloth, waiting nine hours with a bullet in his stomach. And you were there? Yeah. Terrified that they were going to kill you too? Yes. I didn't know what to do. I just stopped my breathing. I lowered it down as much as I possibly could. I didn't move. I was terrified. Just an absolute nightmare. James Longman joins us now from Tel Aviv. And James, you've spoken to so many families caught up in this. Uh, what are you struck most by? Yeah, Lindsay, I've spoken to Jennifer, whose daughter Kim was caught up in that attack at the desert. She just still doesn't know where Kim is. I spoke to Sasha, whose sister Karina was this young IDF recruit taken into Gaza. She's now a hostage. And of course, Rotem, 16 years old, and you saw that story there. Each of these people spoke to me alongside other family members. And that's what I'm really struck by when I meet these people. They are devastated. They're cut through with pain, but they're supported by the people around them in such an extraordinary way. And that is really very, very moving to be in a room with people who are grieving in this way, but also supported in this way. This country is small. Everyone is touched by this. Everyone knows someone who knows someone who was caught up in this deadly attack. And yes, it's horrifying, but there's something really beautiful about the way this country has come together. Lindsay? We thank you so much and really appreciate your, your observations and your reporting, James. Thank you. In the wake of all of this death and destruction, many people are still asking, how could Israel have missed this? Let's bring in our chief global affairs anchor, Martha Raditz. Martha, as Israel investigates this, what are your sources saying about a possible missed warning from Egypt ahead of this attack? Lindsay, a senior U.S. official telling me that they are looking into whether Egypt warned the Israelis of the possibility of an attack days before it happened, something the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee also said today. The White House deflected the question, and Israel's prime minister denied there had been a warning, but it will no doubt be part of an investigation. Lindsay? I certainly will. All right, Martha Raddatz for us in Washington, D.C. Thanks so much, Martha. We will remain on top of all the latest developments out of Israel and Gaza throughout the night, but there's still much more news to get to. Dashcam video shows the moment a suspect jumps behind the wheel of a patrol car and takes off, leading to a wild chase. The next, the battle to name a new House Speaker. Republicans have nominated Congressman Steve Scalise, but does he have the votes to win? Whenever news breaks, to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. 
Welcome back, everyone. We turn now to the latest developments on Capitol Hill, where Republicans are moving forward on nominating a new Speaker of the House following the historic ousting of Speaker Kevin McCarthy last week. For the very latest, let's bring in ABC senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott. Rachel, House Republicans met today and voted on who should be the next Speaker. Break down that vote for us and, and what we can expect to see next. Yes, Lindsay. So all of this played out behind closed doors. Republicans met today for a few hours. They had an internal election, a secret ballot, and they had an option to choose between two Republicans, Congressman Steve Scalise and also Congressman Jim Jordan. Scalise earned the nomination to become the next Speaker of the House, but barely. And so right now, yes, he does have the nomination from the conference, but so far he does not have the votes to be the next Speaker of the House. He can only afford to lose four Republicans, and right now there are at least 10 who say they will not support him. This is going to be an uphill challenge for Scalise. So how long could this potentially take? What are your thoughts? Lindsay, this could take several rounds, so buckle up. A few different scenarios could play out. They either bring this to the floor and it takes several rounds until they get a Speaker of the House, or they could try to huddle behind closed doors once again to try to unite the party. Right now, the House has left for the day. Lawmakers are gone. We know Scalise is meeting with members one-on-one, -on -one, trying to convince the holdouts to come on board. But you have to remember, it was the promises that McCarthy made that got him in trouble and ultimately cost him that job. Lindsay. That's right. The devil's in the details. Rachel Scott from Capitol Hill for us. Thanks so much, Rachel. And we're joined now by Republican Congressman Tim Burchett of Tennessee, who was one of the eight Republicans who voted to oust former Speaker McCarthy last week. Thank you so much, Congressman, for joining us. Uh, the majority of Republicans back Congressman Steve Scalise today for the Speaker nomination. This was, of course, a secret ballot. Uh, so I have to ask, did he have your vote? Yes, ma'am. Steve will have my vote on the floor, and I've uh, firmly committed to him, and I'm I'm pretty sure that we'll have a uh, um, that we'll have enough votes to carry him over the finish line tomorrow, ma'am. And why the delay? Why not take this to vote on the floor today? Well, there's a logistics problem. We actually have members. Um, we have one member I've talked, I t texted with this morning that's actually in Jerusalem or in Israel, excuse me. And we have members that are scattered. Democrat members are scattered out all over the country because there was really we weren't sure when this would come about. Um, I, of course, had hoped that it would happen today, but due to logistics, that just doesn't seem possible. But there appear to be some holdouts still who say that they, they still back Jim Jordan. Are you confident that Congressman Scalise can get the 217 votes he needs in order to win the Speaker's gavel? Yes, ma'am. Uh, it's been quoted on numerous sources that, that Jim has come out and, and stated his, his support of Steve Scalise and that he would, in fact, um, make his nominating speech from the floor tomorrow. So I, I don't have, uh, I, I, you know, people, you know, there, there's open wounds. People are a little sore over it, but I think they'll get to that point. And I think with Jim's support of those, uh, of Steve Scalise and his encouragement to those people that are holding out for his, for him, I think that we'll be okay. As far as those people who are potentially holding out for him, any idea if any of your colleagues may be trying to extract concessions in order to get their vote? I and mean, we saw that certainly with former Speaker McCarthy, but, but that actually in the long run seemed to undermine his ability to hold on to the job. Yes, ma'am, those are some real changes. And you know, you're always see somebody holding out for something. I, and that's human nature. I want on this committee, I'd like to have this bill heard. But I, I think mostly it's just people need to hear from from Steve, and I suspect he, if I know Steve, and I do know Steve, he is burning up the phone lines as we speak. Any concern that a prolonged speaker's battle could impact the House's ability to support Israel following the outbreak of fighting there? No, ma'am. The president has actually unleashed the largest carrier, I believe, that there is in the world, the Gerald R. Ford, and there's talk of another one. And also, um, Israel has basically on auto check from the United States about $3.4 billion, which, you know, helps supply Iron Dome. And they have, um, have very large quantities of armaments that we've helped supply. And I believe they're in good shape. Honestly, ma'am, all that Congress could do, there might be some supplemental funding, but the president is has done that as he did with Ukraine. You said that you voted against McCarthy in part because of broken promises over controlling spending. As you know, we'll be heading to another battle over funding the government next month. Could a potential government shutdown be back on the table? I think it could, but I think I think we're going to get together and work something out. And, you know, we're required to do one thing up here, honestly, by law, and that, that is by law, is to pass a budget and 12 appropriations bills. And we continuous, we continually do these continued resolutions 
30 days, they back them up against a holiday, and then we pass what's called an omnibus, and then we pass a 2,000-page bill where congressmen just read down to what's in their district or what lobbyists they need degrees or what special interests they need degrees, and then and then they vote for it. That's why we're $33 trillion in debt. It needs to quit. It needs to quit now. Well, in fairness, though, the prior administration, Trump's administration, did uh, contribute quite a bit to, to that spending. Yes, ma'am, and I did not vote for those budgets as well. Um, if you want to check my record on that, because I'm, I'm pretty consistent on that type of thing, um, on the spending levels and things like that. We just, I mean, honestly, man, we take in $5 trillion and we spend $7 trillion. And they said over a course of 20 years, the two things that, that bothered them was our leadership and our, and our fiscal responsibility. And we failed drastically in both those. And that goes across both parties. Congressman Tim Burchett of Tennessee, we thank you so much for your time tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you, ma'am. In Alabama, Carly Russell appeared in court today, the first time since police say she faked her own kidnapping in July. The municipal court judge found Russell guilty on two misdemeanor charges after Russell pled not guilty. Both charges are Class A misdemeanors. Each carries up to a year in jail. Because the case involves possible jail time, it's now being moved to circuit court where a judge will determine if Russell is guilty or not. The Federal Trade Commission has proposed a new rule to ban junk fees. The proposed rule would apply to several industries across the economy, including hotels, apartment rentals, and even tick event tickets. The rule would eliminate hidden costs that increase prices at checkout. The FTC says this could save consumers, quote, tens of billions of dollars in fees. Companies that continue to charge these fees could be fined and forced to pay the amount charged back to the consumer. Olympian champion Mary Lou Retton, who became a sports icon back in 1984 when she won gold in gymnastics, was recently hospitalized battling a rare form of pneumonia. The 55-year-old mother of four has been in the intensive care unit for more than a week now. One of her daughters started a fundraising page for her mom, who she says is not insured. The page has exceeded its original goal of $50,000, raising more than a quarter of a million dollars. Retton is still in the ICU, unable to breathe on her own, according to her daughter, McKenna Kelly. And we still have much more to get to tonight on Fun. An ex-NFL player is facing charges of first-degree murder. The close relative police say he killed before then going on the run to Mexico. And we return to the major developing story, Israel at war, the history behind the conflict. A look at what led to this war between Israel and Hamas and failed attempts to stop escalations. But next, could that conflict in the Middle East put gas prices back on the rise? We take a look by the numbers. So much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. 
the kidnapping of Jacob Wetterling would become one of the biggest mysteries in Minnesota history. Who would take a child? Who would do this? Now, new details of how one of the biggest cold cases broke wide open. We may finally have an answer to a mystery over 25 years old. And now, Jacob's parents speak. A guy wearing a mask took your son. He gets snatched by somebody? Snatched. David Muir, Deborah Roberts, the all-new 2020, Friday night on ABC. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small-town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. The worst attack in 50 years. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. Israel at war for nonstop live coverage. Stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. Reporting from the front lines. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. Your wallet may be feeling the relief as gas prices have fallen in recent weeks, but could the conflict in the Middle East cause them to spike again? Let's take a look by the numbers. The national average for a regular gallon of gas is down to $3.66, according to AAA. That comes after prices rose to $3.88 a gallon last month. The drop has been driven in part by the falling cost of crude oil, which spiked to $94 a barrel in September, but has since fallen to a low of $82 a barrel last week down some 13 percent. Demand has also fallen with the end of the summer driving season helping to drive prices lower. But oil spiked back up to nearly $90 a barrel on Monday following the outbreak of violence in Israel, which sparked concerns about wider fighting in the Middle East that could create instability in the oil market. But news today, the top OPEC producer, Saudi Arabia, pledged to help stabilize the market, brought crude oil back to around $83 a barrel, and experts say gas prices would likely only be impacted if we see a worst-case scenario of the conflict spilling outside of Israel. If the conflict stays contained, the prices of the pump could actually stay on their downward slide. One expert from Gas Buddy says prices could fall another 50 cents a gallon by the end of October, and AAA forecasts that some states could see gas fall below $3 a gallon in the coming weeks. A welcome Halloween treat for millions of Americans. And we still have much more ahead here on Prime tonight. New York Republicans take a big step regarding the future of Congressman George Santos, how it could impact his term as he faces charges. And the new revelations from Jada Pinkett Smith on her marriage, including how long she and husband Will Smith have been separated. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The news-making interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward first choice. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. 
is the crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. We'll, of course, continue to bring you the latest developments out of Israel and Gaza in just a bit. But up ahead, New York Republicans moved to oust a GOP congressman. A former NFL player is accused of killing his mother. And video shows a man stealing a patrol car with an officer just feet away. These stories and much more in tonight's rundown. In the wake of a new round of charges against him, embattled New York Congressman George Santos is vowing to fight until the bitter end. The new charges against Santos include identity theft. Yesterday, prosecutors claimed he stole credit card information from campaign donors and made unauthorized charges. Santos insists he will not take a plea deal. Meanwhile, Long Island congressional Republicans are renewing calls for Santos to be expelled from the House. Police arrested former NFL player Sergio Brown in San Diego as he re-entered the country from Mexico. Brown taken into custody after a warrant issued for first-degree murder for the death of his mother, Myrtle Brown. Sergio Brown's mother's body found near a creek not far from a home in Illinois. They both shared. December 2022, Milwaukee police officers making a traffic stop near Houghton and Keith when you hear a door slam. From the police dash cam video and see the squad car drive right by the officer. Seconds later, laughter from inside the cruiser and a call for backup over the radio. Looks like uh, somebody just stole my vehicle. Okay, did you take your vehicle? This video shows an officer with his gun out in an alley. As the officer approaches a trash can, a man pops out. Prosecutors later identified him as Daniel Barton, and months later, investigators say he did it again. Let's respond. This video from Shorewood in May. Barton accused of stealing another cruiser during a traffic stop. Officers arrested Barton in that case about 10 minutes later. In high school, students still seeing their test scores slide. Results on the ACT college admissions test now coming in at their lowest level in more than 30 years. The average ACT composite score last year was 19.8 out of 36. We will soon learn more about the horrifying attack on author Salman Rushdie from the author himself. His memoir, Knife Meditations After an Attempted Murder, will be published in April. He was left blind in his right eye and a damaged left hand following that attack in August of 2022. Rushdie was stabbed repeatedly in the neck and the stomach by a man who rushed the stage as the author was about to give a lecture in western New York. The alleged attacker has pleaded not guilty. 
Jada Pinkett Smith revealing surprising news about her marriage to Will Smith. They've been separated for years. In a new People magazine interview, Pinkett Smith said she and her husband had been separated for six years at the time of that infamous 2022 Academy Awards slap. The actress says they have a deep love for one another and are working on their relationship. That revelation comes ahead of the release of her upcoming memoir, Worthy, on October 17th. Israeli forces have unleashed a relentless barrage of missiles inside Gaza as leadership promises to do whatever it takes to obliterate Hamas from the territory. Gaza is just 75 years old, established from the ashes of the Second World War, but it lies in the cross-section of ancient history and three major religions. In 1948, the Nakba, or the catastrophe, happened for the Palestinian people. Hundreds of thousands were forced from or fled their homeland. Our chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel explains. A warning that Gaza's about to run out of fuel in a matter of hours, leaving millions without electricity and under total siege. Israel's bombardment continuing amid rising fears of a land invasion. The Israeli military sharing these videos, striking what they say are Hamas targets. Reportedly attacking and destroying the home of the brother of Hamas military commander, Mohammed Dave, killing his brother and his children and granddaughter. But Israel not confirming or denying. Over 1,000 killed in Gaza since Saturday's bloody attack by Hamas in Israel. More than 5,000 injured. And on the ground, our team witnessing Israel's retaliation firsthand. Residents like Abu Rafiq stunned. <laughs> telling us this was total destruction with no house left standing. There's been no announcement yet of a ground invasion, but all the building blocks for a land movement are being put into place. If anyone was in any doubt about what Israel's intentions are, it should be dispelled now. We're seeing tank after tank, armoured vehicle after armoured vehicle, and more and more soldiers pouring into this area. Tala Imad Hatsala, a 21-year-old student at the Islamic University of Gaza, is sheltering inside her family home. There's no electricity, uh, there's no food supply, there's no water. Gaza's under complete siege. Food, electricity, water, all cut off, with many desperate to get out of one of the world's most densely populated areas amid fears of a land invasion. One American citizen in Gaza trying to leave with her three children, telling us she feels abandoned by the U.S. Embassy. They say we're going to get you, but they don't. we don't hear anything uh, from them. And it's very terrifying because we all want to go get out of here. The U.S. says talks between Israel and Egypt about creating safe passage for some residents to leave are taking place. But the last remaining crossing out of Gaza was bombed by Israel yesterday. And for now, life inside Gaza is perilous. Maha, an aid worker, recalling the moment missiles struck her neighborhood early Tuesday. We used to be able to see that there was like a six or seven floor um, stories uh, apartment building. Now we could see like the rubble behind um, this one house that stayed standing. Um, this is like the seventh or eighth um, military um, escalation we witnessed, but this time it's different. Really great explanation there. Thanks to Ian for that. As this conflict continues, there will be a great need, of course, for humanitarian aid, and some workers are already on the ground doing just that. On the phone with us now is Yusuf Hamish, an advocacy officer for the Norwegian Refugee Council who's in Gaza. Uh, Yusuf, thank you so much for joining us on the phone. Uh, you've described the scene there by saying it feels like the world is collapsing. Just give us a sense of, of what you're seeing that, that makes you describe it that way. First of all, thanks for watching me, but the world is collapsing. This is literally might be the best way to describe the situation here. Destruction everywhere. No electricity, no water, no internet, no connection. We are isolated from the rest of the world. Hundreds of people are killed. People are fleeing on every every day or every hour. You see, and a different neighborhood are fleeing. The bombardment didn't stop for a second. An hour ago, they just they bombed a house behind, behind uh, where I'm staying now. Until now, they are trying to remove the rubble, trying to find five children under the rubble. And on top of the destruction of the bombing and the threats to life in that way, how are you all surviving without food and water and electricity? How are you even talking to us right now? 
you know, to talk to you right now, I have to be in the, um, in the middle of the street just to find connection because there is no connection. I, I have to flee in my house the first day because I live in a dangerous area. I'm hosted by my relatives. Now we are more than 50 people in one house. If you want to fight bread, you have to wait in line in front of the bakery for two, three hours. Yeah, we are lacking literally everything in Gaza. I, I don't, I don't think, I don't think I, have, I don't have the word to describe the situation here. It's, it's unbelievable situation here. We cannot compare the situation currently with anything before. Two days ago, I went. I, I, I had to go to the center of the city where it used to be the most safe area. I couldn't recognize it. It's land of destruction now. I couldn't recognize the streets. What do you need right now in order to, to make it easier for you to, to provide aid? First, we need a, a safe process for humanitarian actors to do their role to save these people in need. These people are in dire need and they need our, our assistance. We are trying to, with our partners, we are trying to figure out how we can serve these people remotely. But first of all, we cannot ensure our safety to start deliver assistance for other people. It, it, it's an it's, it's unbelievable situation. We need an immediate stop for this war. We need to have a clear access at least to serve these people who are in need before the war. Add to that with all of the circumstances. What do you want the world to know about what's happening in Gaza right now? Well, no, 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 I need to know what's happening now and what happened before and what might happen next. What, what the world needs to interfere, ensuring the, living, the basic living conditions for Palestinians who live in Gaza. And we need a longer-term solution. We keep found ourselves in this round, round of conflict every few months, few weeks. It's sometimes it lasts for a year, but we all know that it's always fragile. It's always. The international community and the world had to interfere, ensuring a longer-term solution. We need to breathe. Last escalation on Gaza was last May. We need to breathe. We need to live. That's what we are looking for, basic rights. Yusuf, we thank you so much for the service that you're providing to the people there, and, and we certainly are hoping that you're able to stay safe and get some of the, the, health and, uh, some of the help and, and aid that you need. And, and we thank you so much for talking thank with you. us today. Thank you. Thank you. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, our team coverage continues as the death toll rises in both Israel and Gaza, the tactics now being used by Israeli forces. And another earthquake in Afghanistan, the damage left behind just days after an earlier one killed more than 2,000 people. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed, getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. 
The kidnapping of Jacob Wetterling would become one of the biggest mysteries in Minnesota history. Who would take a child? Who would do this? Now, new details of how one of the biggest cold cases broke wide open. We may finally have an answer to a mystery over 25 years old. And now, Jacob's parents speak. A guy wearing a mask took your son. He gets snatched by somebody? Snatched. David Muir, Deborah Roberts, the all-new 2020, Friday night on ABC. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with the horrors of war, the haunting images, the mounting death tolls in Israel and Gaza. We're learning new details about the extent of Hamas's planning prior to the attack. Hamas official Ali Baraka claims the group has been planning these atrocities for two years. Israel has continued to pound Gaza from the air, more than 450 targets in 24 hours, even as Hamas terrorists are still believed to be holding 150 hostages in Gaza. The death toll on both sides just staggering. An estimated 1,200 people killed in Israel, among them 22 Americans and 1,100 dead in Gaza. Women, children and babies dying on both sides. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu put aside a bitter political rivalry to create a unity government with former opponents. Hamas continuing to launch rockets into Israel. Our team was there as a southern town defense is. And the first shipment of U.S. munitions has arrived in Israel. A U.S. Navy battle group is already in the region. And speaking late today, President Biden said the U.S. government is doing everything it can to get U.S. hostages home. We begin with our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, with the toll on both sides from this escalating war. It's a war that tonight is being fought mostly in the air as Israel strikes Gaza. Hamas rockets arc over the border, raining down on the southern Israeli city of Ashkelon. Above us, you can see so many streaks of smoke crisscrossing the sky. Today, we witnessed an onslaught. It was hours long. We are pinned down here. Under this aerial bombardment, this is what people go through here every single day. This is why this town is a ghost town. Everything in Israel is a ghost town because of that. As air raid sirens wail, we race into a bomb shelter. Okay, this is another bombardment. It has been incessant. Families with children taking their dogs down. Families huddled together. Ruti with her two daughters, Aviva and Orhava. Ruti telling me this is not the life she wants for them. And these poor kids are growing up in this reality. That's the hardest part. We've lived through wars, but these little kids haven't lived through wars. Today, the children's wing of the local hospital hit with a direct strike. And just miles away, across the border in Gaza, parents clutching their children, too, racing them to safety. In the back of this ambulance, a father comforting his daughters. Don't be scared, he tells them. Don't be scared. The destruction in Gaza is staggering. Whole neighborhoods flattened by Israeli bombs. We can't live like this, this man says. Where should we go? Israel putting Gaza under a complete siege, cutting off food, water, power. 
21-year-old Afaf Najjar tells us she can't stop shaking. There is nothing that we can do. Even the place that I'm in right now is uh, already almost out of water, almost out of food. On both sides of this border, young people trapped in the middle of a war that is only just beginning. It is no way to live. Our, our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, joins us now. Matt, thank you so much for your in-depth report. Uh, you've spent so much time reporting in Israel over the years. Do you feel like this is as unified as you've ever seen this country in some time? Definitely, Lindsay. Um, there is near unanimity in Israel that Hamas needs to be destroyed, and not just militarily, but the entire political organization as well. And I've never seen Israelis come together in this way in the 20-some years that I've been covering this. But it is temporary. Once this war or conflict is over, there is going to be a reckoning. People are go going to want to know why so many warning signs were missed, how the intelligence was in the dark about what Hamas had been planning for many months and how the military failed to respond quickly enough and how the political echelon, including Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, led them down this path. That reckoning will eventually happen, Lindsay. Yeah, well, ultimately, and interesting to see that unity right behind you flashing between the American flag and Israeli flag. Matt Gutman, once again, for us, reporting from Tel Aviv. Thanks so much, Matt. And tonight we travel to what's being called Israel's Ground Zero, a small farming community near the Gaza border named Barry. It's one of the earliest and bloodiest scenes of Hamas's terror attack on Saturday. Our own David Muir saw the horror firsthand at the kibbutz where Hamas attackers went door to door, killing 107 people, mothers, fathers, children, and taking others as hostage. And we do want to warn you, this may be difficult to watch. Today, we went to find a place many here are calling Israel's ground zero, one of the bloodiest scenes from the Hamas terror attack. As we get closer, we see the massive troop presence. It was here a brutal and chilling scene played out Saturday morning. Tonight, the haunting surveillance images posted online showing the beginning of the horror just after sunrise in Beri, Israel, a kibbutz not far from the Gaza border. Two heavily armed Hamas militants right outside the gate crouching down, one on his stomach, peering under the gate. Then walking to the security window, smashing it and crawling in. Moments later, a car pulls up to the gate, the terrorists waiting to ambush them. As the gate opens, one attacker walks toward them and fires, killing them. Then running in, one of the attackers grabbing the security camera. Minutes later, the attackers can be seen from another camera, walking through the center of Berry hunting for civilians. This video showing the militants taking Israeli hostages on the street. Their hands behind their backs, marching them away. And then the images showing people lying motionless on the ground right there off in the distance. Authorities say they were killed. Today, for the first time, the Israeli military allowed us to see it. You can see that we're approaching the gate now to the kibbutz. This is what you actually saw in that surveillance of the Hamas militants waiting just outside the gate, simply waiting for it to open so they could sweep in and begin their killing. Immediately, we see the shattered security window where they waited to attack. The charred car sitting at the entrance. We see where that surveillance camera once was, wires now hanging. And it was not long before we witnessed something else, the scope of the brutality here. There are no words to describe it. What's been left behind here is simply horrifying. The Israeli military uh, telling us that the Hamas militants uh, came in from four or five different directions uh, and began indiscriminately killing mothers, fathers, their children. They tell us in this home right here, they held 14 people hostage uh, during the hours of terror as it was unfolding. The homes here cratered from rockets and from the grenades the attackers brought in with them littered with bullet holes. On the ground, we find a child's dictionary, a shoe, and everywhere here, the smell of death. What did these militants do when they got to this kibbutz? They massacred everybody here. Uh, 112 residents of this kibbutz were, were murdered. We can see just the level of destruction of what happened. And uh, when we imagine you know, they come in early morning, uh, people are asleep at 6, 6.30 in the morning, surprise them in their homes, some butchered in their beds. 
it, it's horrific. They killed more than 100 people here, and they took captives, too. You're all convinced that members of this community, some of them were taken captive and dragged into Gaza? Correct. Correct. And we can't imagine what is going on with them right now. Here in this community, Orthodox religious volunteers have been recovering the bodies here. But we also notice what's been left behind. Everywhere you look here, you see the signs of brutality, what was done to the families here in those early morning hours. And then you come upon this, uh, wrapped in plastic here, another body. Uh, this one, though, is different. You can see in red here, they have written simply, terrorist. They were ruthless. Even the children, they did not spare. And everywhere here, the signs of a morning cut short. It is heartbreaking to see uh, what's been left behind here. These are uh, family photos and a wedding photo here, uh, a photo of, of a father with his child. Uh, but perhaps what hits the most are these backpacks, uh, the children's school bags left right here in the open. The scope of the brutality here, uh, there are almost no words for this. It's no words for this, you know something between ISIS and a pogrom. It's not a battlefield, it's not a war, it's a murder. It's a terror attack. I cannot, uh, you cannot imagine what we saw here in the last three or four days. And you know, you was between the houses, sink on the body, on the mothers, the babies, you know, people that killed by knife, by hand grenade, by fire in the hands children in the front of their mother, mother in the front of the children, people that locked by their hand, by their foot, and shoot it. And as night falls here, the light's still on. What's particularly haunting is what's been left behind here. Uh, as you know, the terrorists got here first thing in the morning as the sun was coming up. Many of these families were just waking up to start their day, and you can see in so many of these homes, the lights have been left on, the families are gone. Uh, you can see right here the bags, the hats, a woman's purse, and we couldn't help but to notice back here uh, is the kitchen. And we knew that these normal daily routines were just beginning. There's actually milk on the counter and beyond us a table that has been set. More than four days now after that brutal attack, the sounds here at night are still chilling. It is though it's frozen in time here now. You can hear the rockets off in the distance, the cars, the doors open, family belongings there strewn on the sidewalk. Another car here, the door left open too. There are signs everywhere of families uh, trying to flee, trying to escape. And in another telling sign, you can hear the alarms, now days after this attack, still going off. Those alarms still ringing tonight a cry for help for those families who had no idea, no warning, this was coming. It's heartbreaking. I have never seen anything like this. Uh, as we walk through the streets, we can see homes. We're seeing family photos. We're seeing remnants of regular life uh, and just unbelievable destruction and, and massacre. And it's, it's devastating to be here. And the smell and the sights and the destruction, and I, it's, it's a nightmare. So haunting. Our thanks to David Muir for that. An extraordinary tale of survival by a 16-year-old Israeli-American gunman burst into his family's home and killed his parents right before his eyes. He hid for hours with a gunshot wound to the stomach. ABC's James Longman spoke with the teen. These are the memories 16-year-old Rote Matthias will cherish. His parents, Deborah and Shlomi, singing and laughing with family and friends. <laughs> But that life was destroyed in an instant when Hamas terrorists burst into the family's kibbutz. His parents killed, trying to protect Rotem from the gunfire. They threw a grenade or something. It exploded. The last thing my dad said is he lost his arm. And then my mom died on top of me. His sister survived the carnage, hiding out in another shelter. When the gunman returned, Rotem took cover under a bloody cloth waiting nine hours with a bullet in his stomach. And you were there? Yeah. Terrified that they were going to kill you too? Yes. I didn't know what to do. 
I just stopped my breathing. I lowered it down as much as I possibly could. I didn't move. I was terrified. Just an absolute nightmare. James Longman joins us now from Tel Aviv. And James, you've spoken to so many families caught up in this. Uh, what are you struck most by? Yeah, Lindsay, I've spoken to Jennifer, whose daughter Kim was caught up in that attack at the desert. She just still doesn't know where Kim is. I spoke to Sasha, whose sister Karina was this young IDF recruit taken into Gaza. She's now a hostage. And of course, Rotem, 16 years old, and you saw that story there. Each of these people spoke to me alongside other family members. And that's what I'm really struck by when I meet these people. They are devastated. They're cut through with pain, but they're supported by the people around them in such an extraordinary way. And that is really very, very moving to be in a room with people who are grieving in this way, but also supported in this way. This country is small. Everyone is touched by this. Everyone knows someone who knows someone who was caught up in this deadly attack. And yes, it's horrifying, but there's something really beautiful about the way this country has come together. Lindsay? We thank you so much and really appreciate your, your observations and your reporting, James. Thank you. In the wake of all of this death and destruction, many people are still asking, how could Israel have missed this? Let's bring in our chief global affairs anchor, Martha Raditz. Martha, as Israel investigates this, what are your sources saying about a possible missed warning from Egypt ahead of this attack? Lindsay, a senior U.S. official telling me that they are looking into whether Egypt warned the Israelis of the possibility of an attack days before it happened, something the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee also said today. The White House deflected the question, and Israel's prime minister denied there had been a warning, but it will no doubt be part of an investigation. Lindsay? It certainly will. All right, Martha Raddatz for us in Washington, D.C. Thanks so much, Martha. So much more to get to on a lighter note. You can't have Barbie without pink. Coming up, the movie's signature color is rooted in Mexican-American culture. We talked to the cinematographer who helped bring the bright shade to the global sensation. The next guards taken hostage and fires burning as a prison riot unfolds. The criminals, experts say, are controlling things from the outside. Whenever news breaks, the crushing families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. The worst attack in 50 years. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. Israel at war for nonstop live coverage. Stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. Reporting from the front lines. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. I'm Whit Johnson, reporting from Maui. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. 
Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Dozens of people evacuated from their homes in Argentina's central Cordoba province as wildfires grew amid an intense heat wave there. Massive flames surrounded populated areas as firefighters worked to combat the flames. It was not immediately clear how many homes had been impacted by the fire. Local media has reported dozens have been evacuated. And another strong earthquake shook western Afghanistan this morning just days after an earlier earthquake killed more than two thousand people in one of the most destructive quakes in the country's recent history. According to officials, today's 6.3 earthquake killed at least one person and injured about 120 others. Inmates at Paraguay's largest prison rioted, taking 11 guards hostage and setting fire to facilities in the crowded penitentiary in the outskirts of the capital. This prison had nearly 4,000 inmates in a ramshackle tin roof building. And according to local security experts, gangs exert near total influence over life inside. And still to come, the true star of the Barbie movie may not be any of the actors, but its signature shade. As we recognize Hispanic Heritage Month, we learn more about how the color choice is linked to its culture. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So, what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. It's already raked in more than $1.3 billion. Talking about Barbie, it is topping charts as the biggest movie of the year. But the star that may have outshined Margot Robbie, Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling was the color pink, more specifically Rosa Mexicano or Mexican pink. The film's Mexican cinematographer Rodrigo Prieto coats his latest work in culture, bringing La Alma de Mexico to the big screen. We sat down with him to learn more about how the artist pays tribute to his culture by giving Rosa Mexicano its flowers. Explain to us what Rosa Mexicano is or, or Mexican pink. Well, it's, uh, it's a color that uh, is very present in Mexico. Uh, since I've been a child, it's been just part of what you see all around you growing up in Mexico City. For the movie Barbie, pink was an important color in the movie, obviously. And when I was looking at all these pinks, I mentioned to Greta and to Sarah Greenwood, who's a production designer, you know, we should really include Mexican pink. And this is just because it's a color I feel close to, being part of my culture. And so then I showed them examples of this color, and they really were attracted to it. And it is a color that's been present in our culture from even the pre-Hispanic times, but it never had a name. And it's basically the color of bugambilias. And there's an artist, um, Ramon Valdiosera, who decided to include this color in costumes that he was making. He had a show in New York, 1949, and uh, everybody was struck by this particular pink that he took from the bugambilias, from these flowers. And the journalists uh, remarking on this color said, oh, this, we should call it Mexican pink. And then it stuck, the name stuck. And did you have any idea the role, the life that this color was gonna take on in the movie? We certainly knew that pink was a theme. 
And we wanted all the different shades of pink to be very present without overwhelming. So it was a tricky technical thing too. To be sure that these colors popped, we created a digital filter for post-production that's based on Technicolor, which is a technique of, of, of creating color in the beginnings of uh, color cinema. Obviously, you've been making movies for decades now. This is not your first time bringing in a, a Mexican color. That is true. You know, uh, for me, color is very important just in general as a, as a means of, of expression. You know, color really uh, influences your perception as an audience of the scenes and what's going on. So I remember one side uh, on this movie, Eight Mile, with Eminem in Detroit. You ever wonder at what point you gotta stop living up here and start living down here? The first thing I did when I arrived in Detroit was to go to the Detroit Institute of the Arts, where Diego Rivera's murals are. And there was this color present in his paintings of the auto workers, the industry. And it was cyan, the sort of green, greenish cyan color. I incorporated that, those colors into the movie. So indeed, uh, it's something that uh, that I have tried to bring, you know, and I think it's just natural that you bring your culture into, into the art that you help create. Has it taken on a commercial uh, value for you, or is it still very cultural when you see that particular Mexican pink? Culture just uh, expands, you know, the specific culture of different people, different countries. And I think that I find that the opportunity to showcase something from my culture and the work that I do elsewhere that's not in Mexico is is a way of honoring my roots. One of your latest projects, you are partnering with Martin Scorsese again, uh, Killers of the Flower Moon. Can you find the wolves in this picture? It's uh, completely different to Barbie. Yes. So, <laughs> it was, uh, not Rosa Mexicano pink. Not Rosa <laughs> Mexicano in that. Neil Kamska. Children of the Middle Waters. It's a very powerful movie about the Osage people where there was basically a massacre of, of many people were killed, uh, individual murders actually, because the settlers were trying to get the oil money that the Osage in Oklahoma, they owned the, the subsoil. So it's a powerful but dark story. So the cinematography is completely different. Barbie is full of light and full of color. Killers of the Flower Moon has a completely different color, color palette. Lily Gladstone stars in this. Talk to us about the way that you're trying to uh, lift up and, and highlight uh, indigenous women. Yes, that is a very important aspect of Killers of the Flower Moon and uh, something that for me is dear because also in my, my country, in Mexico, you know, the indigenous people are also, you know, we're as a nation, we're trying to recognize, uh, you know, the indigenous uh, population that for a long time has been marginalized. We talked with Scorsese, we talked to groups of Osage, and I remember specifically uh, the, the chief uh, telling us, uh, make sure to honor our women. So that, that became certainly in the story itself and, and certainly the focus of the movie. Well, we thank you so much for that cultural impact that you're creating and continuing on. And, and thank you so much for your time and talking with us today, Rodrigo. Thank you very much. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com. The news never stops. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night.